Ready to go? Good evening, everybody, and thank you for coming. It is 7 p.m., and I call the December 14th, 2020 school board meeting to order. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to, the flag to the flag of the United, of United States, States of, America. of America and to the Republic for which it stands, stands. One nation. One nation under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Anita, would you please call the roll? Will do. Trenton David Huseman. Here. Gary Dunlap. Here. Cheryl Hancock is absent. Uh, I am here. Chris Lau. Here. Rebecca Reaver. Here. Barb Wettstein. Here. And Brian Wolpat. Here. Okay, with six of the seven board members present, I do present, I declare a quorum. I note that the agenda has been posted, distributed, and sent to the local media. With this in mind, are there any changes to this agenda? No? Nope. I would entertain a motion to approve the agenda as published. So moved. Gary has moved and... Oh, Anita, sorry, has seconded okay. to approve the agenda as published. Any discussion? I'm trying to watch everybody. Um, hearing none, all those in favor of the motion to approve the agenda as published, please signify by saying yes. Yes. Aye. Yes. Those opposed, please signify by saying no. The motion to approve the published agenda has passed. And I don't think there's anybody for per public participation. I think uh, Stacy was gonna let me know. Okay, thanks Stacy. And then Chris, do you have district administrator's report? Yeah, tonight what I have for you is um, basically an update as part of back in the 2017 Wisconsin Act 143. They um, have that each year, the board is to review um, our after action reports for our drill that is run um, in the schools, the school safety drill. So included in your packet are all those drills for all the schools. Um, they're all within this packet and they need to be reviewed before the end of the year um, as to why they coming, are coming before you this evening. So thank you. Thanks, Chris. And then on to recognition and thank yous. Yeah, I just want, I have one recognition tonight. Um, Dan and Cece Mullenbach have been very gracious and they donated, donated $900 um, to be used towards the purchase is of some golf bags for our girls golf team. So we're just thankful for their donation and very appreciative for their help um, towards that. So thank you to the Mullenbox. Yeah, thank you. Um, COVID-19 update, Dr. Mueller, Mark Engler, and Guy Turner. Yeah. All right. Good evening. I'll start with the update this evening. Um, if any of you have been watching even any of the data uh, outlets or news um, media coming out these days. Um, there's a lot of new research and information coming out, um, especially related to schools and about returning to schools um, in general. Therefore, tonight I want to take this opportunity to just update you on some of these developments. In mid-November, um, I participated in a meeting with other school districts and representatives from the Harvard Global Health Institute. Um, the Harvard Global Health Institute is what we originally used to create our metrics for when students return in the district. Um, the current metrics, um, the purpose of that meeting was to gain perspective on the utilization of their, their model for decision making. Um, at that time, um, we were informed that a revision or replacement of their current metrics was um, coming in that to replace the path to zero in school guidance document, um, which in which we gained all of our metric information from that the La Crosse County Health Department and DHS and ourselves have been using. Um, then just recently um, in late November, a revision of the School for Health um, Risk Reduction Strategies for Reopening Schools document was released. Um, and so we have been starting to take a look and review that. These two documents, along with the new information coming out from CDC, the DHS, DPI, and our local health department have provided us um, guidance and will keep providing us guidance as we further um, start to review and reevaluate our existing plans. Um, so as this new guidance is released, we're gonna be very purposeful, deliberate, 
and take a collaborative approach to analyzing these recommendations from this guidance as we consider how our existing plan can be revised. This will include helping our district determine when it is appropriate to bring back different level learners, potentially in a phased in approach as we have talked about previously. Um, while we feel very confident in our existing mitigation strategies, um, building administrators will be working with staff to review the updated recommendations against their existing plans over the next couple of weeks or here coming up this week and part of next week. Um, this will determine what other questions we need to ask staff and our families um, moving forward. We anticipate the new guidance will articulate the new evidence demonstrates with appropriate mitigation strategies, schools can safely conduct in-person learning even during times of increased COVID spread of the COVID-19. Um, so after this review, we will update our plans and bring a recommendation to the board on January 11th on how we plan to proceed for the January, after January 21st. Because um, currently we are virtual through um, January 21st. So that's an update on the revision of plans and we really need to take a look at this new guidance and, and see what we need to do moving forward. A lot of new research out there. Then um, with student activities, um, the district paused all winter and year round high school, middle school activities beginning November 24th after the Cooley Collaborative began issuing recommendations um, to K-12 schools and districts. Um, the recommendation at the time was to cancel all of our activities through December 18th. Um, tonight, before we bring before you, Mr. Englert and Mr. Turner are gonna present what we have learned since we did pause, um, along with other pertinent information and, um, and looking to um, for some consensus and just discussion from the board around that topic. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Englert and Mr. Turner. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for gathering with us tonight to discuss these important issues. Uh, we do have a PowerPoint I'm going to try to share with you. And if somebody would give me a thumbs up if they are seeing the PowerPoint. Great. Okay, so we're off to a good start. Uh, we're going to bring forth a plan for both high school and middle school levels to discuss what direction we would like to head and what our recommendation is for co-curricular activities. So our philosophy, whoops, sorry. Our philosophy moving forward uh, is we would like to, I'm gonna just, your pictures are taking up a little bit of my slides, so I'm having a little trouble seeing. There we go. Uh, so let me jump back here one second. Uh, the school district of Holman and the co-curricular department understands the difficult situation COVID-19 has presented for our students and families. It is important we find a balance between face-to-face co-curricular activities and the risk environment. When we return to activities, we will take the utmost care to make certain our students are able to participate while using mitigation strategies to reduce the risk of participation. While COVID-19 has made our preparations vastly different than in years past, we are committed to providing students the choice to participate in a controlled environment overseen by adults. So some key words that I've bolded in that statement is we need to find a balance. I think we have um, been very cautious up to this point and I think that's good, but I also think that our students are suffering by not having the ability to participate in face-to-face -face activities. Mitigation strategies was another bolded point. We have worked very hard uh, with our advisors and our coaches to develop plans to make our return to face-to-face -to -face possible. And then remember, there's always a choice. Uh, students choose to participate in co-curricular activities. It's not mandatory that they do so. So why co-curriculars co -curriculars now? Uh, we use many different guiding organizations to help direct us on where we should head, whether it's the Harvard model, 
the Cooley COVID-19 Collaborative, the Department of Health Services, the Center of Disease Control and Prevention, the National Federation of High School Sports, along with the Wisconsin Interscholastic Athletic Association are all different groups that we look to for guidance. One of our primary um, areas that we look for guidance is the Harvard model. Uh, initially, right before school came out, the Harvard model was presented to us. And then more recently, an updated model, um, model of the Harvard model has been introduced. And here are some statements that uh, are surrounded or actually said within that Harvard model. Children are at a much lower risk for COVID-19 than adults. And a growing body of scientific evidence shows that kids and adults can be kept safe in any indoor environment, including schools, if appropriate risk reduction measures are implemented. So that's basically saying that we should be able to move forward and offer face-to-face -face, uh, activities for our students if we plan carefully. Another statement right out of, out of the Harvard model, schools can offer every sport if the right control are in place. Education-based co-curricular activities, students involved in activities are more successful in their school studies. And I would like to mention that the, the model that came out before school and the model that recently uh, has just been released just re re reiterates that co-curricular activities can and should be offered when mitigation strategies are being implemented. So one of our primary guidance organizations and models, the Harvard model, is saying that we should be able to move forward. And that same wording and those same thoughts were seen in many different health organizations as well. The DHS, the CDC, as well as uh, the organizations controlling athletics in the state of Wisconsin and around the country. So the reality. Uh, Mr. Turner, do you want to take, take over here? Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Angworth. Uh, the reality here on this is our um, guy, networks. Guy, can, yes. you're kind of quiet. Can you're, It's hard to hear you. Can you turn it up a little bit, your volume or something, or put it closer? Is there we better? go. I should have checked before. I apologize, everyone. Is that better? Uh, How about now? We'll try it without headphones. Is that better? Yeah, thank you. Okay, I apologize everyone. Uh, the reality is, is our student networks expand uh, when not at home in activities, uh, which can provide a safer environment through the implementation of these extensive mitigation strategies as Mr. Englerth addressed, uh, both in club teams and tournaments and the networking in which students are gathering uh, outside of current um, co-curriculars that are provided within the school district of Holman. Uh, we have seen this and we'll address that uh, in later points uh, for another slide. Back to you, Mr. Englerth. Uh, another uh, good reason for co-curriculars now, we've seen many different school districts successfully run co-curricular activities with minimal issues. Aquinas, Bangor, GET, Sparta, You've probably seen on many newspaper articles, Toma has been going from the very beginning, West Salem. And if you even look at our own school district at the high school, we have between 100 and 150 students in our buildings daily that we work with. And we really have had minimal issues with the students in our building and the virus. Another important part of this is our individual COVID-19 program prevention plans. Our coaches, I have worked hard on these plans, whether it was in the fall or the winter, to develop strategies and, and mitigation plans to make sure that we are organized and ready to go. Each advisor and coach is going to have to have their own plan approved before they're able to start meeting face to face. And Mr. Turner, how is the middle school dealing with this? These plans have been orchestrated uh, with the head coach and uh, definitely uh, the forefront of our varsity programs within uh, the co-curriculars. And what has uh, been noticed is that at the middle level, 
Uh, they have used and, and mirrored the uh, prevention plan set forth by the high school as a means to uh, figure out the best plan of action, but then also understanding and knowing that there is differences between the levels of competition, the practices, uh, spectators, concessions, all of those factors that we have talked about from the fall into the winter side of things. So our plans mirror each other and are definitely uh, respective to levels of uh, play, whether it be sixth, seventh, and eighth graders or varsity athletics. Another important uh, piece to mention is uh, coming from more recent guidance, how important it is that our school's HVAC systems can be turned up to ventilate and bring uh, fresh air into the building more often. When we've talked to our buildings and ground supervisor, Mr. Daly, and he's assured us he can turn this up. So we are replacing the air more often in our building, in our gyms, uh, in our workout areas. So fresh air is being pumped into that area and air that's been breathed out can be taken out more often. By allowing face-to-face -face co curricular activities to occur uh, in the winter has uh, been something that uh, will provide a sense of normalcy to our students' lives. It helps a lot with uh, the social emotional well-being of students. Uh, overall uh, performance is addressed with uh, schools and uh, academics, attendance. These are all, all these factors are playing a big role into uh, students' engagement in the learning process. And finally, strong relationships. Uh, our coaching staff and our advisors do an outstanding job of getting to know our students and building positive relationships with them, uh, which helps that guide those students to making good decisions and being just better students overall. So all of these are really good reasons along with the guidance of the org health organizations to start moving towards offering face-to-face co-curricular activities. Okay. So mitigation strategies that we've talked about, these are 10 important mitigation strategies that our individual COVID plans will address and are expected to be in each plan. Daily screening of students. We'll be asking students how they feel and if they've been around anybody that's been exposed to the virus and taking temperatures at practices and competitions. Washing or just dis disinfecting hands on a regular basis. Uh, wearing masks is a mandatory activity, uh, except when there's a student uh, safety issue. For example, swimming would not be a sport, we would expect them to wear masks in the pool and gymnastics would be excluded as well when they're on an apparatus and doing uh, some technique. Cohorts are very important. We would wanna maintain small cohorts to reduce the possibility of the spread of the virus. So for example, uh, our boys, bo boys basketball program would rarely practice all together. We would divide them into four different groups and separate them in different gyms social distance whenever possible, teach our students not to share equipment, students should not share water bottles or apparel, disinfect shared equipment on a regular basis, disinfect facilities in between different cohort groups, always keep attendance lists at practices and competitions, and react quickly to students who have symptoms and do that contract tracing and make sure that we're identifying students that need to quarantine. Competition uh, mitigation strategies will address. Locker rooms are always an issue. Uh, we would want our students to shower at home when they can, but if they are not able to do that, then we would expect them to shower in their cohorts. The, the athletes that they practice with each day who's on their competition team, we would wanna keep those groups together and not intermingle students. We certainly wanna limit spectators to begin with. Uh, we would limit uh, spectators to immediate families of the home team only. Uh, we would maximize group distancing to slow transmission chains. So parent groups that do come in, family groups, we would make sure they were six feet apart in the stands. 
Masks would always be mandatory of everyone in the facility. And we would try to live stream as many events as possible so people who aren't able to attend could still see the competitions or the performances uh, that we have going on. Travel and competitions, uh, examining the contact level of each activity and the current risk environment to determine the acceptable number of teams competing at event. So for example, you might not see our wrestling team at large wrestling tournaments this year. You may only see them at a duel or possibly a try. Uh, examining opposing schools pro programs for issues with the virus. If uh, another program is having problems with the virus, we would not go and compete. And then of course, riding the bus is always an issue. But again, the recent guidance is saying that if you crack the windows on the bus and you allow air to flow through the bus, that exchanging of fresh out air, exterior air with the interior air will help mitigate that, that issue with the virus. And then of course, sanitizing and dis disinfecting the facility we would want to make sure we're using an EPA registered disinfectant after each cohort's use and at the end of the day. So we do have a number of different plans in place to make sure we are ready to keep our students safe when, in whatever activity that they're involved in. Mr. Turner, I think you have something on a study that was done. Yes, sir. Uh, so with mirroring our Harvard model and WIA um, areas at which we are looking at our um, plans here and creating um, the safest way possible, it's also taking a look at the psychological and physical benefits that drive these for uh, our children and for later in adulthood. There was a study that was done in May of this year by WIA that uh, surveyed over 13,000 students. And uh, it was noted that there was about a 50% drop in physical activity levels uh, from this spring, March to May. And also uh, WIA came out with the fact that uh, three times more symptoms of depression from moderate to severe were reported during that same time frame. So the support of getting students to be back into uh, on the gyms, the courts and, and doing it in a proper way is very important. Uh, that's mirrored with the Harvard model's recent uh, information that was shared talking about that all areas have some level of risk depending on uh, a number of factors. And so those factors needing to be individualized on a specific sport have really guided and led the way to our individualized prevention plans. So some may be considered to be higher risk during competition, but may be lower risk during practices or drills. Three factors to consider that was addressed by the Harvard model is the location in the winter, all being indoors, but also primarily pointing to uh, the distancing ability as well as the size or the group of our cohorts. Another study that was done on fall activities uh, was one with checking to see through fall activities how many students actually became ill with the virus? And is that exceptional or is that what would be typical with 14 to 17 year olds? So if you look down at the chart, we've got two columns, Wisconsin high school athletes. That was a sample group of athletes within the state. Uh, there were over 30,000 students involved in this and they've they determined how many days those students were involved in activities. And then they did a control group of just 14 to 17 year olds in general, where there were almost 224,000 students involved in that control group. And then the number of days that they had available that they could have been active. And then they compared those incident rates. And what you'll see is not only are the incident rates very low, they're almost identical. And actually the sample group of the high school athletes had a lower incident rate than the control group of all 14 to 17 year olds that were sampled. To further expand on this, this was broken down into the different activities from the fall. So you can see uh, about eight different activities that were looked at. They talked about the risk levels of those sports. For example, cheer and dance was moderate, 
where football was a high risk and girls tennis was a low risk sport. If I look specifically at, at dance for an example, they were a moderate risk sport. 73 schools were involved in the study. 1,337 players from those 73 teams were involved then. And out of those 1,337 athletes, 19 tested positive for the virus. So that meant only 1.42% of the students sampled here tested positive for the virus. And you can look down the list of sports, all of them were either in very near 1% or less than 1% of the population testing positive for the sport, uh, for the virus for the sport. In the last column, what that does then is they compare the sample of athletes to the control group of all 14 to 17 year olds. If a number is higher than one, that meant the sample of athletes had a higher incident rate than the sample, than the control group of 14 to 17 year olds. So for dance and cheer, they were slightly higher than the control group, but cross country was lower, girls golf was lower, boys soccer was about identical, girls swimming was lower, tennis was extremely lower, and volleyball was lower. Really the only one that stood out was the high contact sport of football at 1.24. So what this is telling us is that in most sports, the risk of an athlete or of a 14 to 17 year old who's an athlete and just any general 14 to 17 year old is about the same or lower. There is not a huge significant difference showing that sports are causing students to acquire the virus more than any other 14 to 17 year old. So as we reach close to the end of my portion of the presentation, uh, we've been talking a lot about athletics, but there are a lot of different organizations that are, and groups that are co-curricular activities that we're really talking about. Now, many of these groups may choose still to be virtual, may choose to sometimes be virtual or face-to-face, -face, or may want to come back face-to-face -face on a regular basis. For example, I could see DECA wanting to be face-to-face -face on uh, a limited basis. High Quiz Bowl maybe would want to be face-to-face -face on a limited basis. Powerlifting probably would want to be face-to-face -face more often. And so might robotics. So it depends upon the group, but there are a lot of different activities students are missing out on simply because we're not able to be in a face-to-face -face world. We're doing the best we can virtually right now but it's not the same as being face-to-face. -face. So our high school recommendation for winter co-curricular activities is this. Beginning Wednesday, December 16th, allow high school winter athletics and student organizations to meet, practice, perform, and compete in person following approved mitigation strategies. Each cohort existing within an activity will be considered separately and will be monitored closely for individuals exposed to the virus or in close contact with other individuals testing positive for the virus. Students, teams, and cohorts, which will, which will be required to quarantine as needed until 20% of the cohort's participants are quarantined, at which time the cohort will be paused for the required amount of time. And of course, administration always has the discretion to take the most aggressive route to reduce the spread of the virus. So if we need to pause an entire program or multiple programs, we certainly would do that at that time. Uh, Mr. Turner, would you like to take over from here and address the middle school? Absolutely, rather than switching permissions, Ms. Rengarth, if you could just advance the slides, I'll let you know when we need to move on, that'd be great. You bet. So for the middle school, uh, one thing that's uh, different or unique is the fact that uh, we actually were able to start off our season for winter sports, um, in essence, with boys basketball and our sixth through eighth grade wrestling. 
Um, as we were uh, approved and uh, at the time, the students, well, we went back into virtual, um, based on the numbers, we were allowed to continue. However, as addressed earlier, we went and met face-to-face -face through November 20th, at which time we paused. Our season schedule, unlike the high school, does not necessarily have to follow the WIA schedule for high school sports, but rather is an improved conference plan that does follow the length of season. At this time, the end of the season for boys basketball and wrestling will uh, conclude on December 22nd, at which time coming back from the winter break, we kick off six through eight gymnastics, as well as seventh and eighth grade girls basketball uh, for the second portion of the, the winter season, if you will. So I, I guess I wanted to frame the conversation here with that, that we were actually able to be up and running um, following those processes uh, with great success. Uh, next here, we have um, with the current side of um, our, our plans, um, 12 schools are in our Three Rivers Conference, eight of which are looking to have in-house or intramural competitions. One is uh, looking to attempt to have competitions outside of uh, just their building, and three have not yet started those winter sports season at this time. Uh, as you see our registration for numbers, one thing I really wanted to to show on here is that with boys basketball, that is our seventh and eighth grade students combined. And with the high numbers that we had, we had students split up into smaller cohorts practicing face-to-face -face every other day. Um, and since November 20th, when we went virtual, uh, it was almost a 50-50 with seventh and eighth grade students being about 40 uh, student athletes in each of those levels. Um, both of those programs have seen a drop in recent engagement from their virtual practices. Uh, a lot of students are still engaged and passionate about it, um, but some have lost that meet while being virtual. Um, so uh, as of the other day, uh, you can see there's 20% roughly of the Holland Middle School population is engaged in some type of winter co-curricular. Through the Harvard model, these two screenshots, uh, again, just mirror what we've been discussing here, which is to continue with the enhanced controls. And I think the real piece about this uh, that has not yet been discussed is really the top right-hand corner of your screen where it says, consider limiting the number of competitions in a season overall or hold within team or within school competitions, which is what uh, I will address here in a shortly about our um, recommendation as the Harvard model is seeing that within house, if you will, and other schools within the Three Rivers Conference, uh, the majority of them looking to have that same model as well. So the recommendation again is to allow these individual sports to attempt to practice, compete uh, with in-house and intramurals. Uh, for a number of different reasons. Uh, I will not highlight this uh, too much other than on 1A, where it talks about the many organizations that do offer competition opportunities with looser restrictions and prevention protocols. Most recently, uh, there were club teams that shared with us while their students were, our Holman students were at a, a club tournament in the Wisconsin Dells. Um, every one of the schools and communities that were participating, they were not wearing masks. And our, I, I'm proud to say that our coaches in the community in this area all said that we want to do the right thing. Um, and so they made the players and spectators wear a mask the entire time and they follow that. And so I'm really proud of them for doing that. Uh, they noticed that it was uh, at times um, difficult, but it's the right thing to do. So by doing this, we can have these in-house competitions, good practices, learning uh, at high levels uh, with our coaching staff. Uh, number two there, because many of our coaches are, can, are uh, school district of Holman staff. And so we really trust the guidance uh, through those prevention plans. And we will uh, definitely see fruition with number three, a great level of attention to their social emotional uh, learning and development through this, even when we are um, indoors through the winter. 
um, and really uh, dress before. So this is just the fact that our students have in, uh, really helped out with the full rounding of our student athletes, which is why we are here to begin with. These are the school uh, activities that are uh, noted for Holman Middle School. Again, as Mr. Unger said, some of these ones would like to meet under uh, mitigation uh, practices. Other of them have found uh, specifically like spelling bee where uh, the, the spelling bee competition this year will be virtual. So they are practicing and performing and pre uh, getting ready in a virtual side of things. Same thing with our geography bee whereas other ones may be looking to get together face-to-face -to -face based on, uh, again, those uh, pre-approved plans. So at this time, uh, Mr. Englerth and I would like to uh, add questions you have. Okay, um, at, at this time, just seeing if the board has any questions or discussion around uh, the recommendation or what we are wishing to do at this time with um, acti student activities for middle and high school in the district? Well, I'd just make the, like to make the comment that uh, I've been to a few of the open gyms and a lot, of, a lot of kids, middle school kids and high school kids are all going to the open gyms for girls and for boys for basketball. And uh, there's a lot of kids in those groups and they seem to be doing well. And also the, to his point, the club groups are are cranking up and they're playing really hard week to week. Two of my granddaughters are playing volleyball. And then AAU just wrapped up. So those kids are gonna to need to find a home to practice and et cetera, so forth. Um, so I'm, I'm in full support of the recommendation. Um, you know, one, one thing I just wanna mention is, you know, we, we have had, we do have students in all of our buildings, um, approximately about 80 to 100 kids in each of our buildings and we are, using our mitigation strategies and really cohorting. What we've learned is that cohort is very important. And, and one thing that might come up is, well, why would you allow that and not have all the kids back in school in person learning? And really, it's really part of a phased in approach because you can have controls and have smaller cohorts over time. And these kids coming in for these activities are coming in for a very limited amount of time in a very small cohort. And they're really learning those mitigation strategies that they're gonna need to know how to do very well when we have a larger number of students with many more cohorts at one time in a building, if, if that helps, if that makes any sense. So um, that's part of the reasoning too. And um, one last thing, recently I had a call with um, area, um, medical um, professionals in our area um, on Friday in the health department. And they are seeing more and more students with um, behave, you know, the behavioral health aspect inside of things. And um, whatever we can do to start helping get some normal normalcy for our kids, because they are starting to see some of these other um, health or long other, you know, we have COVID, which is definitely, um, a public health crisis and we got to make sure we're doing the correct strategies for that. But then also there's a lot of other, um, which you had saw in the presentation, other parts of um, a child's health that are, be, they're becoming more aware of now over time. So, right. I'll be quiet and just see if there's any other um, questions or comments. Chris, I was just going to, I was going to ask you that question about why not have kids back in school. So I'm glad you explained that. Yeah, I knew that would, I figured you were thinking that, one of you, and I know parents, if they're, are, are probably wondering why too, and, and really, that's, with all this new guidance that we just received, we're going to be working really hard on how can we phase in, especially our long, younger learners initially, um, um, with these mitigation strategies, while keeping our staff as safe as we can, so we got to really work hard on, on taking a look at our plans we have and how can we improve them? Because we've had a lot of staff here working very hard um, in our buildings with students. So thank you. Thanks. I appreciate also that um, how it was stressed that this is a choice. And so if family mm -hmm. feel strongly against it, it isn't something that they have to participate in, but it is an option for those who are comfortable. So um, I, I find that to be helpful personally. Thank you, Barb. That's a very, very good point to make. 
Any other questions? Okay, if we want to go on to social studies curriculum update with Kim Edwards and a group of other people. And team. Okay, I'll go ahead and um, share my screen here. There we go. <clears throat> So good evening. We actually have um, two curriculum presentations for you tonight. The first one comes from our social studies team. Um, so we have Rhonda Rayburn with us from the high school, um, Emily Lovell from our middle school, Sarah Werngerter from uh, representing grades three through five, and then Caitlin Hindinski, who's um, bringing up our K-2 program. So and we've provided you with the full, uh, the finished both social studies and music curriculums in your board packet. So this is really just a more of an overview uh, of the process that we worked through. So um, last year when we presented the new alignment of the high school courses and really went through really how we had worked, um, we're working to rework the K-12 program, we shared this timeline with you. And you'll notice at the bottom, um, we had uh, planned on reviewing and piloting some resources for our middle school and elementary programs. And while middle school um, is doing a little bit of work on this, we had to um, pull that back a little bit at the elementary program. Um, that's something that we may get into depending how the end of the school year goes, but that is something we may have to table till next year. Um, very briefly, again, the new standards are all inquiry based, meaning that they really encourage that critical thinking, collaboration and the development of communication skills. And they're organized around these five domains that include the behavioral sciences, economics, geography, history and political science. Um, now what I'll do is turn it over to Rhonda, who can tell you more about the specifics of what we have going on at our high school. Okay, so we did make a few changes to our curriculum, which I'm sure were presented um, before. We did uh, change our social studies nine to a U.S. history three for our freshmen, um, and then giving our sophomores an option of another U.S. history. They can either take um, it shouldn't really say the 1020s, this should say the 1920s to 60s or the U.S. history from the 60s to present. Uh, we did actually add another required class, economics, for juniors or seniors, and that will take effect with this year's freshman class. Um, they continue to have uh, the government requirement, and they must pass the Wisconsin civics exam in order to get a diploma. Uh, you can see the electives on this side over here. Uh, so students need to pick 1.5 credits from there, uh, and that uh, would, you know, gives them, actually, there's about 20 classes offered in our social studies department. Does anybody have questions on any of those issues? Okay, each of our classes uh, went through and wrote their curriculum. Uh, they wrote it unit a unit at a time. So this is just one example of one unit in a U.S. history class. Um, you know, telling what that the unit would be the industrialization. Uh, that it's going to be eight days long, looking over what are the overarching objectives. Uh, priority standards, again, um, as, Ms., as Kim Edwards had said, there are five strands, history, economics, political science, behavioral science, and geography. So this is a history class, so obviously they're focusing mostly on those history standards. Um, the learning targets would be things that they would want them to be able to accomplish, like uh, verbs, like evaluate and analyze and summarize. And then the supporting standards would be standards um, that would be in addition to these. These ones would be the ones we would focus on. And these would be ones, you know, if we have time, uh, they would be in there in this virtual environment. Some of those may get bumped out, but we definitely would stick with our priority standards. Um, we did do some uh, <clears throat> resource reviews over the last couple of years. This is just a few of the resources that we have um, picked and <clears throat> are either trying or have implemented. Um, and there's just a wide variety, again, with 20 classes. We aren't going to list every book that we have because that would be kind of overkill and, and needless there. But this is just a few of the resources. And then there are some support uh, books. So these are, again, maybe just a few of them, uh, but the book Animal Farm for U.S. History 3, that freshman class, Growing Up in Holman for Wisconsin History, Mission of Honor uh, for U.S. History 2, and Daughter of Ward, and they poured, us, poured fire on us from the sky for genocide. Okay, and I think that takes us right into our middle school program with Emily Lovell. 
So for the middle school, um, we didn't really significantly change anything in terms of uh, our basic content um, that we had laid out in sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. Um, sixth grade is still focusing on ancient civilizations, um, ancient cultures, uh, though we did drop off some of the things that over the years have been bumped up from elementary school, just skills type things that kids have been coming in without due to cutting social studies. Uh, and so based on everything about where we're moving forward at this point, we've kind of taken that back out. Um, so hopefully that will help <laughs> with some structural things. Uh, seventh grade primarily focusing still on geography and eighth grade being that focus on uh, the second round of US history. Um, same kind of thing as what the high school did. We basically took at each grade level, um, unit by unit, uh, went through and, you know, uh, chose, well, we chose priority standards first and then unit by unit went through and determined which priority standards fit uh, that unit and wrote learning targets and essential questions and the uh, supporting standards and then working those inquiry standards in there as well uh, with that being really the biggest new thing and change that came from our new standards. So this is just an example of one of those from sixth grade, that same kind of thing. And then, yeah, like as Kim had said, we have kind of struggled with this uh, resource piece because it keeps kind of getting pushed back, but we are uh, looking you know, and, and talking about things and have ideas about kind of where we want to head with some of this, but hoping to jump in a lot more with trying things out. Uh, in sixth grade this year, we are uh, piloting uh, Discovery Kids, which is an online uh, database of uh, nonfiction text, basically. So we've been working with that uh, at my grade level and uh, kind of trying that out. That's been our main thing that we've we've actually gotten to test out in this process, but we're really hoping to get a little bit further with that soon because obviously the time is now, but um, we're also excited to try some new things and, and um, get moving forward with that. Okay, and this takes us into K2 with Caitlin. Hey, so our, um, really our elementary work kind of got paused last year. Um, we got, we had a full work day last fall and we really kind of dug into kind of some units, some standards, um, and then we were not able to meet again. So we were hoping to kind of start implementing some stuff this year. And that's kind of been put on pause for now, hoping we can pick that back up in the spring. But you'll see for specifically our K2, we're broken down more by units. Um, and in kindergarten, the big difference from that from first and second grade is the focus of what we teach is year round. Um, so as a kindergarten teacher, we're teaching these kids the skills of working and playing with everyone, decision making, you know, self-identity, who am I throughout the entire year? Um, and our work is more of a big picture. Uh, and then it kind of rolls into first grade where it starts to get a little bit more specific. And then second grade gets even more specific yet. Uh, so we're still working on those five categories of the behavioral science, econ, geography, history, political science, um, but it's at a much toned down level um, from even the upper elementary to make it applicable to our younger learners. Okay, and then 3-5 has shake up. Uh, so 3-5 has been a little bit of a shake up. Uh, lots of things, not a lot of things have changed, but yet at the same time, a lot of things have. Fourth grade is no longer gonna be the sole focus of Wisconsin history. Um, it is spread out more evenly now between three, four, and five, and fifth grade will be the one who does Wisconsin as a statehood and going through all of that. Uh, and we're really trying to work in geography more continually through it because that is something that uh, hasn't happened and we our middle school cannot take that on so it's and it works in with the new standards that's it biggest changes okay and then this is an example of the uh, elementary curriculum map set up just the same as we saw in high school in middle um, and then, as I said, elementary ended up really kind of being paused this year in terms of taking on uh, piloting some resources. These are some of the um, um, uh, 
oh, I'm blanking on the word. Some of the companies that we have looked at, um, we haven't actually started with any sort of um, pilot at this time. Depending on how this spring goes, that might be something we'd be able to consider, but um, very possibly this would be something that would wait until um, next year when we're better poised to take that on. Um, we have been able to participate in some staff development. You'll see um, at teachers at all three levels were able to participate in an Act 31 conference that took place at CESA. That's our uh, American Indian Studies uh, Act. So we were able to dig into that. Um, we also were able to host a special event for our middle school and high school teachers where we really dug into that inquiry-based teaching for our new social studies standards and even looked at some of those um, open ed resources and how to integrate those in. Um, with that, are there any questions? No questions. Oops. Now I lost my agenda. Hang on. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so now music curriculum update. Kim again. Okay. Let me get back to sharing my screen and then um, I will introduce with that. I'm um, Shelly Hertz and she can introduce the music team as I get that set up. Is that me? Shelly still um, on? Yep, I am. All right. Good, okay. good evening, school board. My name is Shelly Hertz, and I'm the K-12 district music chair. And I'm here with Rachel O'Donnell and Michelle Jensen from the middle school and high school music departments to share a completed music curriculum with you. This slide represents our timeline of curriculum work. In 2017 and 18 was our self-study year. 2018-19 curriculum writing. 2019-20 implementation of curriculum and identification of resources and purchasing resources. Please note that in 2019 and 20, we also added three new music educators at the high school, middle school, and elementary levels. So this was brand new for those teachers. We added Stacy Clark at the high school and middle school, Mary Anderson at the middle school, and Courtney Supanich, a traveling elementary teacher. We began our writing process in 2018, right after the state of Wisconsin adopted new music standards, which mirrored the national music standards. These standards focused on the following topics, create, perform, respond, and connect in general music and in performance. These new standards also had new grade bands, K2, 3, 5, 6, 8, and 9, 12. And you'll see that on the following slide. So that was a huge change, having those different grade bands. Next slide, please. Our first step in the writing process was to take the new Wisconsin state standards and check which standards were being taught at which level. Each level, elementary, middle, and high, then created a standards pacing guide to accomplish this task. These guides also showed our learning targets and when the students were introduced, progressing, and set to master the standards. Here's an example of a sixth grade orchestra standards pacing guide. Our next step was to create a year long curriculum maps that showcased our Wisconsin state standards and our grade bands, units, priority standards, and learning targets. Since these will be posted to the district website, we made them look visually simu similar K-12 so that they would be easier for our stakeholders to read. Here are two examples. 
The one on the left is for elementary and the one on the right is for high school band. This slide shows the criteria for resource selection that was given to us by the district office, featuring content, instructional design, and technical design. The next two slides discuss um, our current resource review that we developed in the 2019-2020 school year. We met as a department to prioritize our list per level and the following slides showcase some of the purchases we made with the curriculum money at each level. Our orders were completed in March of 2020. So at the elementary level, we purchased a variety of resources. The first thing we purchased were 20 iPads to be split between the four elementary music rooms for more added technology integration. We are really excited to add them into our classrooms when they are returned from distant learners. We also purchased Music Play, an online curriculum supplement, which has been invaluable during virtual learning. Other purchases included several tenor and concert ukuleles to add to our traveling ukulele unit, various percussion instruments, and music literature to enrich our lessons. Now I'll turn it over to Rachel O'Donnell for the middle school update on their purchases. All right. At the middle school, um, we were able to purchase um, large ticket items that our yearly budgets do not generally allow for. Um, our orchestra uh, was able to buy needed items, including uh, rock stops, which hold the cello and bass instruments securely on the floor. Um, orchestra also purchased several replacement supplies of replacement strings, um, the consumable rosin that the students use, um, string mutes, and also was able to replace um, cases for several school or instruments that needed um, fixing or they were just not able to be repaired. Uh, our choir purchased a new Clav Clavinova piano to replace the acoustic piano that had been used in the room for many years. Um, the electric piano um, allows Mr. Sight, the choir teacher, uh, better intonation with his choirs. And this piano, the electronic piano, um, mimics a, a normal acoustic piano very much, but it doesn't need the uh, tunings that are required as a, an acoustic piano needs done. Um, and depending on the temperature and conditions in the room, humidity in the room, it can happen quite often that that piano went out of tune. So he's very happy to have that. Choir was also able to purchase a subscription for the program called Sight Reading Factory. Uh, this program is to help students become better sight readers. Uh, which is a vital skill for um, excellent musicians and especially for choir students who have to do a lot of um, seeing and hearing when they produce the sounds that they are creating. Uh, General Music was able to purchase a set of classroom keyboards with benches to start a keyboard unit in the General Music class. Um, books and other needed materials were purchased to replace items that were eliminated um, when the middle school keyboard lab was repurposed a number of years ago. Uh, band was able to read, re, pardon me, band was able to replace and upgrade several instruments, including um, we were able to purchase a four valve tuba, um, two four valve euphoniums and a double French horn. Um, these step up instruments have uh, provided the double purpose, uh, first allowing um, our high achieving middle school students to learn skills and techniques that are not possible on student level instruments. Um, these instruments have given our students the technical ability to achieve higher levels of playing, um, which has allowed them more opportunities to participate in honor ensembles and honor bands and also perform um, more challenging music because of the um, extra technical ability in these instruments. 
Uh, the second purpose of purchasing these instruments was to allow more students to participate in band on instruments that are generally considered too pricey for families to purchase and, are, and music stores don't rent because they are quite pricey, such as the baritone, the tuba, and the, the double French horn. As our HMS bands have grown, um, we've had to limit the number of students playing these instruments um, due to lack of equipment. So by um, adding these instruments, we add more um, available instruments for students to use um, that are school owned. And um, with, cause without these instruments, if as the band gets larger, if we don't have an equivalent a number, um, it can jeopardize the blend and balance and sound of our bands. Um, so we, uh, the students I know, as you can see in these pictures, these are just a couple pictures I took. Um, the students, I know the families and the directors of the HMS music programs are very grateful to have been able to make these purchases. So thank you. Now we'll have um, Michelle Jensen talk about the high school purchases. Well, Rachel said it all. <laughs> she did a great job explaining um, um, the purchases that the middle school um, made and, and we um, did much of the same. Um, our orchestra purchased um, many much needed consumable supplies like rosin and, and bows and, and cases. Um, our choir was able to make an investment in uh, choir literature, which is really our true means of delivering our curriculum. Um, we choose our literature to align with the standards at which our kids um, are at, um, and, and that is our, our vehicle of delivery is, is that literature. Um, in the band department specifically, um, we did invest quite a bit of curriculum funds into um, new and current literature. Um, much of it um, is, is from our Wisconsin School Music Association um, list for the large ensembles. Um, we also purchased a subscription to the Sight Reading Factory. Um, that is, it, it is a great tool for our students to improve their music literacy. Um, and we're noticing improvements um, already. Um, we actually implemented it last spring um, and we, we use it on a weekly basis with our students. Um, and it's, it's really interesting because you can customize it. You can, the teacher can decide the parameters in which the students are working or the students can customize it. So if you've got a kid that needs um, some special remediation, you can set it for that. Um, the high flyers can customize it to more advanced levels. Um, so it's a really great tool for every student to use. Um, we also purchased a new Clavinova. Um, and as Rachel said, it's, um, this is a, it's a very nice tool. It doesn't need the intonation uh, checkups that an acoustic piano needs. Um, um, and this is a, a tool for us to use department-wide um, it's, it's got, we've already used it this year um, to do some recording for our uh, practice tracks and, and online tracks that we're posting on Canvas for our students to use in, in their homes. Um, we also upgraded and replaced some, some pretty old instruments. Um, we purchased some marching euphoniums and some concert euphoniums and a concert tuba. Um, replacing some instruments that were 25 plus years old um, and adding to our inventory so we can also maintain that great balance and excellent participation in our programs. So, and thank you uh, for supporting those curriculum purchases. Right, because, um, that's all for us. Thank you for your time and we appreciate your support. And our, does anybody have any questions? No, okay then. Kim, you're up again with the elementary report card. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh. Well, uh, good evening. I'm here again with um, a few members of our instructional services to uh, team to share with you, whoops, to share with you our um, updates to our elementary report.
forward. Um, but before we dig into it, I do want to introduce you to the newest member of our instructional services department, Lacey Sin. Um, she is our newest hire and is our new instructional services supervisor. And then um, I'd also like to introduce you to Tracy Sommerfeld, who's our district literacy coach who helped in some of this work as well. Um, we also have a number of member of our team, um, Brenda Geyer, who is our math coach, um, who also participated um, in all of this work. So the elementary report card actually was one of the first big projects I was um, asked to engage in when I first came to Holman. Um, we do have a standards-based report card that we've had um, its inception was in 2010. So um, the report card hadn't been updated in, the, in, in that time. And um, our staff really felt that this was something that we needed to take a look at. So from the onset, our goal really was to develop a report card that was a better communication tool for our teachers, our parents, and our students. So knowing that our team, the instructional service team, was really going to be facilitating this process, we knew that our first step was to get all of us on the same page. So we actually participated in two different um, book studies. Um, this is an example of one of the books, but we also had another one as well that we invited um, our teaching staff and our administrators to participate in as well. And so while we were building this, we really used this time to create and develop a common understanding of what we were looking for, really create that plan, assemble our teams, and then um, dig into doing the actual work of um, updating our standards-based report card. So Knowing that uh, we were going to be facilitating this, we wanted to make sure that we had um, everyone's voice, in, voice involved in the process. So um, we used our teacher teams who worked in there, that we have curriculum teams throughout the elementary that got together um, and worked during their early release time and PLC times. And our um, Tracy and Brenda and then Kelly Schmitz, our previous instructional services supervisor, really helped to facilitate some of those conversations. Uh, our building administrators also really worked closely with our instructional services staff um, and their teachers as well um, to engage in this dialogue. And we were actually able to get um, parent and guardian volunteers from all four of our elementaries to be part of this process. So on this very rough timeline, uh, you can see that we use district early release days to work on uh, particular tasks. For example, early in the fall, uh, we examined other district standards-based report cards. We compared our current draft to our newly aligned priority standards. Um, then we, uh, we came up with a draft that we then brought back to our parent group and asked them for feedback. And what we were doing is we were actually, we were really to make sure that this was a tool that everybody could use. So it wasn't in friendly, a family friendly language, was it easy to read? Did it have enough information, et cetera. So then we would take those pieces of feedback, we'd go back to our teacher teams, who would then uh, make more adjustments. And we continued to go back and forth this way throughout the spring, even after, um, we entered into the pandemic where our teams were continuing to meet virtually. Um, our instructional services team was meeting with um, our teacher teams virtually. And then we even continued to meet um, with our parent groups as well virtually. So that by the end of May, we finally had uh, reached our final draft. Now you'll notice that uh, at the end of our, our rough timeline here, we had hoped to roll this out the beginning of the school year. Well, the beginning of the school year didn't look quite like we had anticipated. So we actually rolled this back a little bit later, um, but are uh, rolling it now so that we are just in time for our first use of the new report card, um, which would take place in January since we use those report cards on a semester basis. So, um, the next piece we did was prepare for all out for teachers. And so Tracy will kind of step you through what we did there. So our instructional services department utilizes Canvas for our teacher professional development and also to house resources. So in looking for how can we get this information to teachers in a way that's friendly for them, we created a Canvas course for our elementary teachers that will support them as they use the updated report cards. The course has videos and supporting materials for many different things, including the performance indicators and how to score students on the standards-based report card, the content indicator statements and standards alignment that go with those indicators, 
general information about what standards-based grading is and how it's implemented in the school district of Holman. We also have how to collect student evidence over the course of a grading term using assessments, work samples, teacher observation, and many other tools. There's information for teachers on how to input the grades into Infinite Campus, and we also have linked any supporting documents that are shared with the community on our website. We continue to communicate with teachers that we are there to support them as they use the report cards and as questions come up and have included direct links to our emails in the course. And then I will introduce you to Lacey who will take you through um, what we've done to prepare the rollout for our families. Hi everyone. Um, so the instructional team worked really hard on um, how to roll this out to the families. There will be a letter um, going out with su supporting materials for families. And then there also is, um, we uploaded all of um, these portions into the website. So Kim, if you could click on that, that should be a live link. On the School District of Holman's website, um, there is a section that families can go into the departments. And then if they scroll down, they can look under um, grading information and then click on that elementary grading information. And you can see there's a lot of different um, support documents in here for families. Uh, the first one, I don't know, Kim, if you wanna click on these, but the first one just goes through the parent information on what, again, is standards-based grading? Why are we doing that in Holman? And it also has um, on the bottom, the different performance indicators um, for the families and kind of what those indicators mean. Um, the next link below that on the school district's page is some frequently asked questions and answers. So any, any kind of questions that come up, um, this would be a good resource for parents to go to first um, because these are very common frequent um, questions that have come up. So how do teachers determine scoring indicators is one of them. Um, considerations for students receiving special education services is another frequently asked question. Um, underneath that um, link, there is another link for um, the performance indicators. And this is just a little, um, kind of like a little, what would you call it, bookmark um, with the different performance indicators for families to look at. And lastly, um, by grade level, you can go in and you can look at the content indicators by each grade level that will be reported on the standard or on the report card standards. So it breaks it down into all the different subjects there. Okay. Do you have any questions for us on the elementary report card rollout? Okay, okay we're good. Think, sorry, we're under the school safety plan with Matt. Mr. Myers. Yeah, I think, yeah, I'll share my screen here. It seems like Kim needs a break, so I'll take a couple in a <laughs> I just want to note that this is one item that is on your consent agenda for tonight. Okay, board. Thank you. So the music department uh, picked an excellent background when they were doing their presentation, but I assure you we're talking about a little bit different topic here. Um, we'll review the comprehensive school safety plan. You'll note some different dates on this page, some in 2018 and some in 2019, based um, on what's required and when, and some of those being triennial requirements. So this, this presentation will walk us through um, some of those steps and then note some changes. This data is about our uh, school violence drills that were conducted in 2019 in your board packets today, the 2020 drills. Are listed. Um, this again goes back a year to uh, when they were held throughout uh, 2019 and have been previously reported and received by you. We're also required to report on the trainings that we have on school safety. So you'll note that 637 attendees have participated in 
mandatory reporting of child abuse and neglect and threats of school violence. Um, the same amount of attendees also went through our COVID-19 mitigation training. Completed another round of adolescent mental health training with 16 more staff members trained. Currently have 89 staff members trained in nonviolent crisis prevention and intervention. And another goal that we're working towards is a streamlined reunification process in the event that we needed to evacuate one of our school buildings and students to another location. Two school staff members and our school resource officer attended a recent uh, last February reunification training by the I Love You Guys Foundation and the Wisconsin Department of Justice to start um, bringing that program and that process to fruition for us. We also have um, several community service partnerships. So this part is slightly updated from last year with our WISCA assessment happening in 2019 and then sharing those results with our Holman Area Fire Department and HPD as we are working through those plans. We continue to collaborate with both of those groups, including having our school resource officer as a member of our safety team. Holman Area Fire Department's been in instrumental in providing ideas for our um, building construction projects. And then our HPD, um, of course, working with school safety, but not only that, uh, with our special event planning. One special event that I'd note and a community partnership that has expanded over the course of the past years with the La Crosse County Health Department, um, both the HPD and the Holman Area Fire Department were able to consult on best practices for our testing site with the National Guard. As you know, we've hosted a COVID-19 testing site at Holman High School over the last six Fridays. And the LCHD reported to us last week that we've had over six, 1,600 people tested at that National Guard site. Within a comprehensive school safety plan, there's um, four phases that we look at, prevention and mitigation, preparedness and planning, and response and recovery. Response and recovery will be two areas we highlight towards the end of this presentation. In the area of prevention and mitigation, many of this, again, has been reported previously, but I just want us to focus on the fact that things like PBIS and our Spragio system for anonymous threat reporting still hold and do hold a lot of value in the virtual settings. So we have many hardworking PBIS teams who are working um, to deliver that type of instruction um, in components of social emotional learning virtually and have been powerful tools for our teams and schools. Um, in the area of preparedness, again, a lot of this information has been presented previously, but just want to focus on the National Incident Management System and knowing that even in things like a pandemic, those um, values of that system still hold true. So certainly a lot of logistics and operations, and while we may not use the exact terminology, thinking of things in terms of those structures has helped us with our plans. Also have a component of preparedness, and I just want to highlight, um, again, as we start to think about reunification and what that may look like for our district, having in-house transportation, strong nutrition services, and I would even add um, our IT department, having those things in-house will help us um, get everybody on the same page and quickly if we were to need to transport and move students to a new location and think about how that day would play out. Within our response plan, again, we'll highlight a little bit more about it with our response and recovery team is working on, but there's a lot of um, linked pages and response guidance for various types of emergencies. And those are things that we'll be continuing to reflect and review on as we go through the process of reissuing and revamping our school, our comprehensive school safety plan. And the same would hold true again for these letter templates that are part of our response. In the area of recovery, again, looking to restore learning and infrastructure as quickly as possible. That includes emotional support, academic support, and the physical and structural logistics, along with the business and fiscal logistics and finances that go along with that. I want to highlight some of the work of our crisis and response and recovery team. Um, I am a part of that team along with five of our school counselors, um, really focusing on that student health and safety. 
We've done a lot of walking through different scenarios and processing through the lens of um, not something happening, but how we would respond to that and then what the recovery process would look like. Developed a lot of tools and resources for some of those critical situations. And this team does an excellent job of bringing this information back to their PLC teams, fellow counselors, administrators, and district and school safety teams so that we can practice uh, these types of situations, say the death of a staff member, um, and be able to have a plan in place and then reflect on it um, in a tabletop setting before we would actually need to utilize a tool like that. Over the course of this next year, we'll be reviewing and rewriting aspects of our comprehensive school safety plan because that will be brought to the board again for review in 2021. You mentioned that crisis response and recovery team. They're going to continue to meet and examine specifically those two phases of school safety. We want to continue to evaluate our systems and structures of support as students are able to return to the buildings um, after some may not have been here for quite a while. And of course, we want to continue to partner with the HPD and others regarding trainings and learning experiences that we can go through together to strengthen um, the bond that we have and the collaboration that we have with our community organizations. So with that, any thoughts or questions on school safety? Anybody have any questions? All right, thank you, Matt. And I think you're up again, postgraduate outcomes. Yeah, I'll share that screen as well. Matt, I don't know, you were cutting out a little bit in your presentation. I don't know if there's an yeah. adjustment um, that you'd need to make. It was a little bit skipping. So. Okay, I'll try to scoot a little closer to the mic and maybe that'll help the next thank round. You. All right, we're also going to talk ACP annual review and our post-grad outcomes. Our ACP coordinator, Lindsay Seip, is going to join in at, uh, towards the end of this presentation uh, to share more about what that looks like in action at the high school. So PI-26 does require an annual review of our ACP, including our information about our post-secondary outcomes. So we'll take a look tonight at intent, enrollment, persistence, and graduation. Just a little bit more um, information about what an ACP plan is, including the activities, instruction, and resources that Lindsay will share a little bit about, and the need to uh, review our E4E plan. Our E4E plan will be reviewing over the course of the next 18 months to set a new plan in motion beginning in 2022. And we're excited to do this and dive deeper into this work, including things like an analysis of the labor market, uh, which could be looking a lot different in a post COVID world. It almost seems strange to say post COVID. I don't know that I should commit to that yet. Just taking a little bit of a look at intent. Um, this is the class of 2019 that we'll look at in terms of where they're at in post grad and their outcomes and pathways that they're taking. 122 of our students uh, are attending four-year universities or intended to um, enroll in four-year universities, 60 in two-year technical college programs, and 34, as that's our biggest three groups, were either employed or seeking employment at the time of graduation. The next set of graphs comes to us from the National Student Clearinghouse. And you'll see this one being the percent of students who were enrolled in college in the fall immediately after high school. And note that 62% of our students in 2019 did that. And that is a pretty consistent trend. If you looked over time, our average starting with the class of 2012 is 63%. 
like to dive a little deeper um, into those numbers and see um, just what institutional level many of those students are attending. And you'll see that 37% head towards four year universities, while 25% head towards two year universities. Also like to compare that between public and private institutions, and you'll know 55% of the class of 2019 going to public, while 7% heading to private institutions. Finally, uh, looking at that when in in-state and out-of-state, 48%. Pretty consistent over time heading to in-state universities, while 14% are heading to out-of-state universities from the class of 2019. Of the data for all the students we have enrolled, all of our past graduates enrolled in universities currently, I always like to look at this chart um, as an interesting one. Where are they going? And you'll see um, the vast majority of our students heading to Western Technical College, in terms of four-year universities, not surprisingly, UWL near the top. Uh, most of these top 10 or so um, do not change year to year. Sometimes positions change within the rankings, but um, no big um, substantial changes were noted this year. I think it's interesting to see the first couple of colleges that aren't in Wisconsin or Minnesota are right in Iowa with Iowa State University and Luther College. Finally, the really colorful graphs um, start to show us who's graduating. So um, just taking a look a little closer at some of that. For the class of 2012, you'll see 50.3% currently have graduated. The class of 2013, 52% have graduated. In the class of 2014, you'll see 43.5% have graduated. So some interesting data there um, and on how they or where they're going. So then we'll take a look just a little bit at where ACP and being college and career ready. Some of the things we do um, on, the, on the back end or the front end, I should say, to get them there. Thanks to our middle school counselors for contributing to this slide and noting um, that Zello is where they start. That's the academic and career planning software that we utilize. Middle school gets us started with that and they'll use this program for activities from six through 12th grade. The career day is an annual event held for eighth grade students, which happens at TC prior to selecting classes for high school. In sixth grade, some focus on learning style, dream life, explore careers and clear clusters. In seventh grade, matchmaker, dream life, and exploring careers. In eighth grade, they're looking at the personality inventory, post-secondary options, and then they also meet with a planning conference with their school counselor and parents and guardians. They are in the process of moving this conference into eighth grade year, but have just been halted a little bit because of COVID-19. They also work on course planning and their four-year plan in January with the support of the HMS math teacher and the HMS and HHS school counselors. Lindsay, who wanna take us through high school? Hi everybody, thanks for having us. I'm Lindsay Seip and I'm the ACP coordinator at the high school. And I am just going to talk to you a little bit about what we're doing at the high school regarding ACP and some different things we've been implementing uh, last year and this year. The first thing is our ACP day, which has been going on for a few years at the high school. And the ACP day takes place when our juniors are taking the ACT test. Uh, we provide the ACP day experience um, for ninth, 10th and 12th graders. And so the ninth graders explore different businesses within our area. And so last year we had students go to Ultra and Quick Trip and train. Um, Mayo Health Systems and Fastenal, to name a few. And then our 10th graders break up into groups and they go to two and four year schools for post-secondary. So we had students go to um, UWL, Viterbo and Western. And then 
had a group go to Winona to see St. Mary's University, Winona State, and Southeast Technical College. And then our 12th grade students had a wellness day um, at the high school where we brought in different speakers uh, that talked about everything from budgeting to mental health to um, hosting a Zumba class, things like that. The second thing that I'm going to talk about is Trade Tuesdays. I started Trade Tuesdays last year when um, during many different meetings and encounters with local businesses, people, uh, businesses kept asking me, how can we get involved with high school students? How can we connect with our high school students? Um, how can we talk about the jobs and careers that we have locally? So we started something called Trade Tuesdays and it happened Tuesdays during our lunch waves and different businesses came each Tuesday and they brought a hands-on um, display exhibit thing to set up on our stage within our lunchroom. And it was really awesome to have students learn more about local businesses and local career opportunities within our area that I think even some of us adults didn't understand and didn't know were out there. And it really also uh, provided a great opportunity for businesses to come into our buildings and meet students and get to know students better. The next thing is Zello, as Matt talked about, uh, the middle school students use Zello as well. We use Zello at the high school in a different fashion. So some things uh, I feel like each year we're getting better about implementing Zello and really maximizing what Zello has to offer our students. So this year we're starting in the process of uploading course planner into Zello. So our students will be able to access their four year plan um, via their Zello account. And so it will kind of be a one stop shop, which will be really great. So they can go into their Zello profile and they can do college searches and employment searches and they can also create their course planner, which will have all of their courses that they have taken and hope to take at the high school through their four years. And so it will really help them find a pathway and then focus on the courses to help them get those grad requirements, but also the focus on the pathway that they hope to enter um, post high school. The next thing is an ACP crosswalk. And so our ACP team at the high school, we have really been trying to develop a crosswalk type document uh, that is showing that we can show the public and the board and other staff members what ACP activities and curriculum we are doing for each school or each um, level at the high school. And so that we have an ACP plan on the website. Matt and I have talked a lot about there's this really large plan. How can we kind of summarize that plan and make it very user friendly so people can read this crosswalk document to see, okay, all ninth grade students are doing these following activities. All 10th grade students are doing these activities. So that's something that uh, is in the process right now that we've been working on and we're making really great progress on. The next thing is career experiences. And I think this is something that I, I tell students, I can't believe how many experiences they have with outside organizations to really get their feet wet with experiences regarding um, jobs and careers that we have to offer. So we have a lot of different partnerships and collaborations in the area. Scenic Rivers is one that they provide so many different health specific um, experiences for students such as job shadows and we last year had a surgery day that I was able to take a group of students to the ice house uh, at Gunnarsson Lutheran and we were able to watch an entire knee replacement surgery. Um, so we were, the doctor was in the operating room while he was operating on the patient. He talked us through the entire process, the entire procedure. Uh, and then we all learned four different kind of sutures and we got to practice our stitching and we got to do laparoscopic surgeries on mannequins, things like that. So that's one thing. Western Technical College offers fantastic opportunities. I had the opportunity to take a group of students to Hero Day last year and 
that really focused on firefighting, EMS, paramedic, um, and law enforcement and at their facility out in Sparta, which really was eye-opening for a large group of students who are interested in those fields. So many, many different opportunities. Our career expo at Southeast Technical College that we went to last year really allows students to um, learn about what else is offered in the community and help them plan for post-secondary options. And the last thing is academies, rest, um, registered apprenticeship visits, and then our capstone that we've started this year at the high school. So next year we will have a fire and EMR academy with Western Technical College. So students from Holman High School will be able to um, collaborate with Western and Onalaska Fire Department, where they will be able to take their Firefighter One course and an EMR course at the fire department. And that's put on by Western. And then we have an IT Academy that's also in collaboration with Western. Um, we have, I had a meeting this morning about the registered electrical apprenticeship meeting with students who are hoping to take that pathway. And then we've also started capstone projects at the high school this year, which is really exciting. And I'm really excited to watch that unfold. It really allows students to um, create a project and work in conjunction with a staff member at the high school in something that they are passionate about. So it's um, similar to an independent study type thing, but on a topic that they're really passionate about and then working with a staff member as a mentor. Matt, can you go to the next slide, please? So this is just a fun, I had a little walk down memory lane and pulled some pictures from all the different events, a few different events that we went to uh, last year. So in, including our, um, our ACP days. So you see people in gowns at Quick Trip as they were entering the bakery um, area of Quick Trip and then Western Technical College and Dave's Guitar downtown. Um, as well as we had the owner of Gunther's Flowers come and everyone made corsages and boutonnieres. So that was ACP day. You see a few people in um, scrubs and gowns and that's during our surgery day that I mentioned for the knee replacement. And then a few of our Trade Tuesday pictures as well as um, a few pictures of students from the Heroes Day for Western Technical College. And here is a um, breakdown a little bit of what I was speaking with in regards to the Zello course planner. So in the top corner, that's a screenshot of what the course planner will look like. So students will be able to log into their Zello account. They'll be able to see their courses in 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th. Um, they'll be able to see how many credits they received, what grade they received in the course, and so again, all of that information will be held right there within their profile in Zello. The next is the career cluster inf information. This is something that we have put into our um, course catalog for this coming school year. As students are getting ready to register, um, we have focused on our the 16 career clusters and have focused on what's involved with that career cluster, what kind of careers you would have if you were in that pathway, and whether it's technical college or a four-year college. And then a little bit about if you were interested in this specific pathway, what are some activities that you should get involved with at the high school? Uh, what are some activities that maybe you would enjoy doing that would make you a really great fit for that pathway? And then at the bottom of the page is the Holman High School Pathway Wheel. Uh, the Counseling Office, we created this last year and it really has been a great tool. Um, it's fine print <laughs> on this slide, but it is on the website so you can see it a little bit more clear. And it basically takes those career um, or those career clusters and breaks that down. So if you wanted to go into a construction and trades what are courses found at the high school that would help you get there? And what are courses that we would recommend you take um, if you were interested in a specific pathway that would give you a better understanding and 
a little bit more well-rounded as to um, that pathway specifically. I'm happy to answer any questions if anybody has high school questions afterwards. So then we just want to take a look at our future district implementation goals, including um, having more regular meetings and revising that district committee. And then Lindsay brought up a really good point about bringing our business partners in and seeking more input from some of those community business partners. Mentioned earlier that our ACP and E4E plan goes through uh, June 2022. So now's the time to be reflecting and thinking about what our next plan should look like. And then a common refrain I hear from ACP team members is we do so many things that are ACP, but we don't really call it that. So when we write a plan and think about these things, we wanna just strive to tie all these things together as this is really a plan. Um, and I noted here that it's a district plan, but it's really a community plan where um, everyone is a stakeholder in this process. And thanks for sticking with me as I powered through some microphone issues. Anybody have any questions? Thank you, both of you. And now we go to Melissa for the employee handbook language. We, Melissa, we can't hear you. We can't hear you. There we go. Oh, that was Chris. Nope. Well, we can move on to the next agenda item while she works on that. Should we do the 2021 school year calendar with Dr. Mueller since we can hear you? Sure. Here, let me, I'll share my screen. Oops. <laughs> I can hear. I don't want to do that. Um, okay, so tonight I bring before you um, a proposed draft of a calendar for the 2021 22 calendar. Um, this will look very from very similar um, to this year's calendar. We didn't want to make too many changes for the upcoming school year. So the calendar has a start date of September 1st. That is what we are allowed to, um, when we are allowed to start our instructional time um, by state statute is the first day in September. And then we have 178 student contact days. This is, that is the same as this current school year. And then we would have our last day of school on June 3rd um, is the last day of school. So as you can see, um, once again, we have in here the, sorry, here. Oh, there you go. The yellow ones are our non-work days or no students would be there on days such as Labor Day. We have built in, once again, this um, one day in October um, for students and staff that they would have off. And then we have our Thanksgiving um, short break and then over the holiday season here and um, a day in February like we have um, in the past years. And then um, kind of a um, spring, short little spring break here, um, Memorial Day. And then we also have um, early releases still occurring um, on Wednesdays starting in October um, for um, staff to meet and have professional development. So with that, I this item is on the consent agenda for tonight so that we would be able to post and share out with families so that they could plan for, um, we usually like to do that before the first of the year. So, any questions on the calendar? Okay. Thank Thanks, you, Chris. Melissa, do you want to try again or? No. <laughs> okay, should we try, uh, where are we? Um, Julie Holman, budget preliminary budget input variables, oh. best estimate. Actually, I, I think I'm okay. on there before her with- Yep, I'm board. sorry. That's Ranking okay. Board. That's all right. It's probably important that I present before she does because mine leads into hers, so. Okay, so um, each year we, um, have it where we submit un and underfunded needs. Um, the administration submits them and they work with staff on getting what those are and um, it's submitted to us as a district. And what these needs are is, these are things that maybe don't 
maybe don't, these things that don't fit within our current budget that we currently have. And we wanna try to find ways to either, one, build them possibly within this um, upcoming 2021-22 budget as to why we're gonna share these before she presents. And then, or um, we have that list in case we decide we want to take other actions such as a referendum to fulfill these needs, or we might look, um, sometimes people are kind and do donations or um, we try to um, allocate resources differently. So those are a lot of different ways and solutions we use, but we like to um, share with you the items each year that um, are on the list and in, in what we have in the works. So I'm gonna share my screen of our currently ranked list. Um, publicly here with you. So on our ranked list, um, one thing that has come up in a lot of conversation in our focus on equity, in our focus on reaching all of our different um, uh, uh, stakeholders within our school district is um, having a Hmong cultural liaison. Um, and that ended up, um, when we ranked this against all of our criteria in our measures within the district, it came out as um, the top of our list. Um, and then um, second, we had our instructional support materials. So that's just a lot of different materials to help support instruction at our middle school level and for middle school learners. And then the middle school, um, that building space, that's just around some different um, needs having to do with remodels within the school or um, different updates or some space um, needs within the school that are more around just um, space within um, an area such as a band room or choir room and so forth. And then um, fourth on that list is a communication specialist. This has come up many times and this is around kind of having someone, especially when we're in a crisis situation to help with that communications, um, but also branching that out to be supportive um, in other ways with all of our community partners that we now have with like the Boys and Girls Club that is new in town. And as you know, ACP, we're working on um, building our business partners and just making sure we have good timely communication. And we're now with um, all these, with the referendum and everything new that we have going on, also being able to really share and market all um, that we have to offer in the school district to Holman. And then just as we go down the list, instructional coach, um, we have some instructional coaches right now and they it's been very valuable and has really helped um, move student achievement in our district and Im improve um, and help with instruct uh, staff and training and and help within um, with our staff and then um, there's always some facility parts on the um, list too such as our HVAC at Viking um, I'm just gonna highlight a couple others. You can see the rest on the list. I'm not gonna go through all of them, but I just wanted to highlight, um, as, you, as you probably recognized about a week ago, we had a internet was down in the district. Um, this is something that was kind of out of our control and has happened a couple times in the last year. And um, we work with a company and when their fiber optics get cut, it, it affects our district. And we go north to the district where some of our neighboring districts, um, their fiber optics don't go that same direction, so aren't as affected. But we thought it might be valuable for us to have a backup um, for that when that happens in the future. So we don't have to, especially if we are in virtual learning, have to shut down operations within our school district. So um, that we thought would be, um, it might not be ranked as number one, but that might be an important piece that we want to fund within our budget this upcoming year. Um, so I'm just gonna stop there. And um, there's also included in your packet a further list of the, what are we call unranked. Um, so what we do is we take the top three items from each of our areas and rank them and put them on the ranked list. And then on the unranked is just the um, other parts of um, other needs that have come up. Um, one thing I'm proud to say is our list has been getting um, shorter. So we have done a lot of great work over the past years and um, done a great job. There always will be needs beyond our means, but um, the list, you know, our, our staff is doing a great job of, of reallocating resources and really looking at what do we really need in the district. So, um, and this won't be on until the uh, next meeting in January for consent. So if you have questions, 
um, after looking further, you're more than welcome to ask them now or, or before the next meeting in January. Thanks, Chris. Anybody have any questions? Okay, now it's Julie's turn, I think. Budget preliminary budget input variables, best estimate. Sure, do we wanna to try to give Melissa a chance or are we gonna move, keep moving? Where'd she go? She, she's back on, sure. Oh, now we can hear you. All right, yeah, is that I, all right? We'll I, go back up one or two? Sure. Okay. Okay. I moved to my phone, so you have to just look at me and nothing on the screen. So sorry, <laughs> this is what you get. Um, <laughs> so I am bringing language forward tonight um, that um, based on the timeliness of the issue, it is on consent as well. Um, this language would um, fall under leave time for our staff. So if we kind of reverse back to the spring, um, you may remember the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, the FFCRA came out and provided staff with some leave time um, options, some emergency paid sick leave and emergency family medical leave. Um, that is expiring December 31st. And as of right now, there is no, um, change within Congress, nothing's being talked about to extend this. So we anticipate it to end on December 31st. So um, we do commit ourselves to the safety of our staff and students, as you heard earlier this evening, um, talking about the different things that we're doing in the district mitigation purposes and those types of things. And um, we do understand that it can be a financial hardship for staff to be out if they don't have leave time available um, due to um, COVID, which is nothing anyone would expect to pick up and have um, so we are um, recommending tonight that we provide a continuation of um, certain sections of the FFCRA effective January 1st through June 30th. There would be no carryover of the current leave. This would be a brand new pool of leave that would be available for staff specific to COVID related absences. Um, the proposal would be to provide an additional 10 days of leave for emergency paid sick leave for staff. Um, under the um, certain specific reasons listed within that language um, and also providing um, additional emergency family medical leave acts. Um, and that benefit is specific to staff who um, have children whose school or childcare has been closed due to COVID. Um, and as we know right now, we are currently virtual through January 21st. So, um, it just seemed right to extend this benefit further into the year. So um, the Emergency Family Medical Leave Act would not be paid for staff. Um, currently under the FFCRA, there is a portion of their pay that they do receive. Um, the recommendation we are bringing forward would not pay them. If they took Emergency Family Medical Leave Act, it would just um, allow them um, the job security to come back and the benefits associated with their position. So um, again, this is on the consent agenda for tonight. It would go into effect January 1st and end June 30th. Um, if something were to be brought forward in the near future um, that is mandated upon the district, this language would go away and we would follow any mandates that are brought forward. So um, any questions on this recommendation. Okay, thanks, Melissa. Thank you. Now, Julie, budget, preliminary budget input variables, best estimate. You're up. All right, thank you. Okay, hang in there. I think this is the last report item tonight. It's been kind of a marathon for you guys, but um, we'll get through it. So it's that time of year where I bring to you the input variables for the updating of the five-year budget forecast model. Um, tonight I'm presenting on those variables for the development of the 2021-22 budget. The School District of Holman um, does subscribe to a model called Fivecast through Forecast 5 Analytics. And so the format that I am sharing on my screen um, is kind of just the input format that they uh, provide to us. Not every line item is used by the school district of Holman. So that's why you see some blanks within the document. Um, recurring variables that tend to have the most impact on the budget from year to year are included in the presentation. 
um, and a copy of the issue paper input variables and the enrollment input data has been provided in the board Google folder. Budget variables are assumptions for planning purposes and will likely need updating in the forecast model because of outcomes of the next legislative session um, beginning in the spring of 2021. The impact of COVID-19 on the school district budget will also contribute to unpredictable variances in the budget outcome. Board approval of the five-year forecast input variables will be recommended on the consent agenda on January 11th. So we begin with the um, contracted regular staff or wages for regular staff and the input variable on wages. Again, this would be um, for pro projecting the 21-22 and the following four years of budget in the forecast model. Um, wages and base wage negotiations are typically, um, the conversations are surrounding the consumer price index urban rate. That's the negotiable uh, base wage input um, when we are negotiating, for example, with our HEA for July 1 changes um, and the actual July 1, 2021 um, CPIU urban consumer price index urban rate would be available more like mid January. Typically, we project that the rate for July 1, 2021 for base wage um, will be about 1.21%. This estimate is based on using the first 11 months of data from January through November of 2020, and then the year-on-year -year historical trend. Around this time of year, that projection starts to become fairly predictive. The five-year variance from November projection to the final number is actually near 0%. So it's, it's getting close to being very um, accurate, at, and it's estimated at about 1.21%. However, for the purposes of the five-year forecasting model, I recommend that we use an input variable of 2% for contracted employee wages for 21-22. Um, in the forecast process, there are several scenarios that are actually created and conducting, um, trying to account for all the different variables that the legislature is talking about in the House and the Senate and bills that come forward um, and any sort of recommendation that may impact our revenue requires updates to our forecast. Using 2% in year one, followed by 2.2%, which is actually the rate that was used in last year's input variables at this time. Um, in the remaining years for contracted wages, it allows us to analyze the impact and pot potentially provide the board with some flexibility to consider wage comparability increases in excess of the maximum allowable negotiable uh, CPIU rate. So this is very common in the school district home and we've looked at this in the past. We do those comparable um, wage, those wage comparisons to our peers and our MVC plus three districts trying to um, maintain competitive wage rates so we can attract and retain our employees. Um, and in the past, uh, the board has approved increases above the CPIU for specific comparability wage increases. So in areas where employee groups are falling behind their um, you know, neighboring uh, peers for the same job classification, same starting rate, things like that. Um, we try to bring up those wages so that we can retain our employees and attract new ones within those positions. So we, I would like to recommend using a 2% increase in the forecast model just to see if we have that flexibility as we analyze those comparable wage rates across neighboring districts. Um, that being said, uh, two years of consecutive en enrollment decline, uh, the current economic uncertainty related to the pandemic and a new legislative session beginning soon are just some of the reasons to proceed carefully and conservatively. The first of the uh, pair of studies that was released last week by the Wisconsin Policy Forum, which is a nonpartisan group, indicated that the state would need to spend down its budget reserves by nearly 400 million in order to balance the next biennial budget. Even if the governor and lawmakers rejected every request for additional spending from state agencies, they would still need to tap into that rainy day fund um, by $400 million. On the brighter side, the report notes the state has substantial reserves to lean on, but also notes, quote, the state also faces massive additional costs for state health programs for those in need. Um, so board members, if you're interested in reading those two articles that were um, 
reported last week, they are available in the WASB legislative newsletter from December 11th. And it talks a little bit more about um, the state having to tap into that rainy day, which is currently a surplus, um, but depending on how much is asked for in this next legislative session, we'll have to see how willing they are to exceed the 400 million already estimated um, as a spend down. So that's just a little bit on the contracted regular staff for the budget input variables. Next up, I'm just gonna go right down the list on the screen is substitutes. And this slide item does not include our teacher substitutes or our educational substitutes. Most of those do um, come through our contracted services with teachers on call. So that will be down under purchase services. This substitute line item um, is referring to increase wages for substitutes, cooks, drivers, custodians, um, administrative assistants, positions that we do not contract with teachers on call for. Um, in February of 2018, the substitute employee rates were increased. This is not something that is done annually. Matter of fact, it's not even done um, very often. But in order to stay competitive in substitute wages, we propose using an input variable of 2% every other year of the projection forecast. This input variable includes um, positions other than teachers and EAs, as I mentioned, who are obtained through the contracted service. Um, so just trying to, again, be competitive in our substitutes um, and trying to maintain um, a pool of substitutes interested in something in the school district home and we need to keep the rates competitive in our, um, to our neighboring districts. Next up is the input variable for um, FICA or Social Security and Medicare. That one has not changed since I started in school finance. <laughs> so many, many, many years ago. Um, and so I project just keeping it for now at 7.65%. That's a combined Social Security and Medicare tax on payroll. And then after that is the WRS or Wisconsin Retirement System board portion or board expenditure portion. That increased from 6.5% to 6.75% on January 1st of 2020. The contribution rates for the WRS do change. Um, sometimes they increase, sometimes they decrease, and they um, often it is determined on the market and the investment rate of that pool for the retirees. And so if, um, let's say more retirees are drawing on the pool and the investment rates are not very good in the economy, the rate actually may we, may go up so that we're contributing more towards the pot for all WRS, WRS eligible participants. Whereas if things are going really, really well in the market and in the economy and that pool of money is growing, we might see a decrease in the contribution rate. That's a rate that can change on January 1 of the calendar year. So with an uncertain investment environment, I recommend using the constant 6.75% in the forecasted years, which is the current rate. Um, both employer and employee rate for WRS contributions. Next is the health insurance um, increase input variable. Um, for 21-22, I would like to use an 8%. I really don't know. <laughs> Nobody really knows what's going to happen to um, health insurance. Um, typically, it, uh, our renewals are based on utilization within our group. And when utilization costs exceed premium, we see an increase for July 1st for the plan year. Um, we all know that we're in the middle of a international pandemic and the impact on health insurance and carriers is a little bit unpredictable. Um, speaking with our agent last week, oh, we talked to her about um, what does it look like for your your groups that are renewing January 1. So a lot of private industry renews January 1 as opposed to schools that often align their insurance renewals with their fiscal year. Um, and the range that Janice Swabra, some of you might know, um, Janice from the Insurance Center, the range that she was seeing for January 1 was minus eight to plus 22. So some somebody got a, a decrease and um, the highest increase that she saw for January 1st was 22%. So again, it is unpredictable. Uh, we don't have enough utilization information yet for July 1st through today, uh, the first half of the plan year. Um, that information will start analyzing after the new year and we will follow our typical cycle of bringing information to you in February and then again in May for the renewal. Um, I do wanna just Note quickly for the board that uh, we are working with our agent to explore group health plan design and local comparability. 
Um, we're working on drafting an RFP to get additional carrier quotes, both on our existing plan design and potentially uh, looking at other alternative options. It doesn't mean that we're adding a second plan to our current offerings, um, but we want to look at what is out there, look at more carrier options and design plan type just to see um, if there's something that would be um, in our best interest to add as an option for our employees. Um, so more information again will come in February and after um, when we start looking more closely at that data and putting out an RFP to carriers to analyze um, the response and renewal uh, quotes from those carriers. So after the 8% increase input variable for uh, school year or fiscal year 21-22, then you see an estimated decline to be used in the forecast of 6% followed by 5%. Um, again, this is a variable every year that can change depending on our group utilization within our plan. The recommended dental percent increase is 2% across the board for all five years. Next up is the non-salary and benefit um, expenditure assumptions. Um, so everything we're looking at so far is expenditure assumptions that are large impacts to the general fund fund 10 budget. Um, the first line item there, it's uh, object 319 for purchase services. And this is a contracted teacher substitutes. We do contract for teacher and education assistant substitutes through teachers on call. And even if we do not increase the rate, for example, that we would um, pay a teacher to sub, the contract itself can still increase based on inflation and the cost that the company has um, to provide benefits to their employees or overhead, things like that. So sometimes we don't even change the rate we pay the teacher per day or the hourly rate of pay for an educational assistant and the contract can still see an increase. Um, again, just a reminder, this is for fiscal year 22 and beyond. We are currently, um, we have very low teachers on call services right now, very um, challenging to find substitutes. Um, it's been several years where there's been some challenging substitute pools, but nothing like um, during a pandemic. So just really challenging to find people that um, want to um, come in and do that work if we need them. Again, we've been virtually for um, teaching virtual for many, many months. And so we also haven't requested as many as we would have in prior years, um, nowhere near. So um, that's kind of still kind of out there for this current fiscal year and what that's going to cost the school district, but the uh, budget input variable for next year and beyond, I'd like to use one in 1.55% uh, per year. Next up is um, the property referendum. So you see out in fiscal year 25, $705,000. So a reminder to those um, that are watching or that might forget back in 2017, we had a referendum for safety and security. Um, that was a multi-year referendum and most of that work is wrapping up right now with the completion of the Viking two-stage entry, uh, which is almost done. But during um, that referendum and what passed in addition to safety and security and cameras and two-stage entries for many of our buildings was $705,000 um, reserve, which is reserved for a future project to put towards a McHugh Briggs Road um, project improvement. So. Uh, two years ago, we moved that money into the sinking fund in a separate checking account and reserving it for that project. And it is only a placeholder within this uh, forecast model because it will take, you know, the county and the village and the district, um, every kind one kind of coming together to decide when that project would actually take place. So it is a placeholder that I am just reserving a spot within the forecast model for that um, money to be spent at some time in the future, but it's kind of out of our hands at the moment. So the next item is uh, object 358, purchase services communication. And this is um, was mentioned just previously by Dr. Mueller in regards to uh, backup or supplemental secondary um, internet services in the case of emergency. So we can continue service delivery um, when that happens. 
I don't think I need to say anything else about that. It's just really challenging when it happens. And, and on my end, we always worry about making sure that payroll occurs for everybody across the district. And of course, most recently, also um, interruptions certainly to instructional delivery. So um, the next line is software services, uh, option code 362. This is um, set aside, um, or at least asking for in the forecast model for a improvement in our Skyward mod, mod um, Skyward software. So 15,000 would be the migration cost in 2021-22 with a small annual increase to our um, annual license for Skyward. So the Skyward platform um, called Cumulative is their latest platform. It was introduced a couple years ago. We've kind of been watching and waiting other districts and learning from their experiences as they migrate to Skyward Cumulative. Um, it is a priority to make this change. Currently, our district is required to use two older versions, um, two different platforms of the Skyward software. Um, and one of them is actually quite outdated. It's called PAC, which stands for point and click. And if you've been using technology for a long time, point and click is pretty old. So um, the reason we still have to use two platforms is because Skyward did not add the payroll module to their what's called web platform. And so we are still using PAC and web in Skyward, uh, depending on which functions are being um, conducted within business services. So the migration to Cumulative would consolidate into one more modern platform um, for the district and for business services, um, providing greater efficiency and allowing for um, advanced data retrieval. Again, the migration cost initially, because you get a team, a migration team from Skyward, it's quite a bit of work to migrate, a lot of setup, um, and you get that support team um, in the first year and the migration to the new platform is 15,000 followed by uh, more minor annual increases in the software license. Next up is object 382, purchase services, open enrollment transfer. Um, input variable recommended here is 4.8% across the board. Um, and just a little quick reminder on open enrollment in Holman. In 2021, we did experience an increase of 32 students into Holman, but also an increase of 25 students open enrolling out of Holman. And the total net um, for 2021 is a negative 224. Um, so we, um, even though we have students open enrolling into Holman, um, the net balance is minus 224 resident students open enrolling out. And that obviously costs money in state aid to the school district of Holman, which is transferred to um, those school districts in which they enroll. So we have experienced a negative out um, since school year 2008-9. So it is common. I mean, this is kind of what Holman has always had. And we've talked about that in the past. And we're not here tonight to talk about why open enrollment out is a, um, like a net negative. Um, but it does cost the district money. We need to plan for it um, because we get less revenue in from other districts aid than we have to send out to other districts. Um, the average five-year increase on the state aid transfer for open enrollment is 4%. So each year in the last five years, the average increase for that transfer um, to the other district has gone up 4%. The next legislative session will determine the future aid transfer amounts. Um, with our negative out trend and uncertain state aid transfer, um, I am recommending a 4.8% input variable um, for um, open enrollment expenditures. The next area is um, skipping down to utility assumptions, uh, half a percent per year for five years for gas, for heat, electricity for heat, and electricity for other than heat, and 2% across the board for both water and sewer. For district insurance, now this is um, not employee benefits insurance, but uh, liability, property, crime, cyber, all sorts of other um, insurances for risk management. For liability, recommending 2% across um, the board for annual premium increases 
And then for property in year one, 3% followed by 2%. The reason for the 3% in year one is the addition of the 70,000 square feet and the remodel project at the high school. And that will have an impact on our property insurance premium in order to make um, sure that we're covered, covering that new property July 1 of 2021 forward, if not sooner. That project is also starting to wrap up. So. As far as Fund 27, um, the special education assumptions, um, we pretty much use the same assumptions on wage and benefits as in Fund 10. Fund 50 is our school nutrition fund. Um, these budget input variables and the forecasting is primarily done on Funds 10 and 27, not as much on school nutrition. Our school nutrition supervisor, Mike Gasper, um, is responsible for his budget. We work together to create that budget and those assumptions around it. And it's not necessarily included in the forecast model except for wage and benefits because um, the staff for school nutrition are included in our base wage um, conversations and agreements for July 1 that we, that we do every spring. The last piece under expenditures is manual adjustments, one time only. And this is just um, demonstrating to you that we do have three years left on the technology referendum. And that is a $450,000 additional expenditure and revenue. Um, so both sides of the equation, but showing it here um, for fiscal years 22 through 24, the remaining three years of the five year uh, voter approved referendum for technology. So next up on the revenue assumptions, um, the input variable for October 15th um, equalized property valuation is 4.65%. This is based on a 10 year average growth in the school district of Holman. Um, our most recent year on year growth was 8% from 2018 to 19 and just over 5% from 19 to 20. Um, but I'm looking at a 10 year average um, because of the anticipated economic challenges, moderate property valuation increases are estimated in the near future. Now there still is, appears to be quite a bit of building going on in Holman, so we'll continue to evaluate that. Um, but with um, eco the economy in question, usually building slows down a little bit and, and those um, end times kind of are out there further into the future before those projects get wrapped up, especially residential and uh, development buildouts. Um, so we'll keep an eye on that. But again, I'm projecting, um, or I'd like to recommend using a 10 year average for the school district of Holman at 4.65% um, for all five years on equalized property valuation. So the next one is the per pupil revenue limit. Um, Increases in the revenue limit are tied to the increases in the three-year average membership. Um, we've had two years of declining enrollment, so that coming into our next three-year average membership is, is going to have a, an impact and a slight, slight decline in membership over, over those, that three-year average. Um, I am not currently recommending a change in the input variable for the per-pupil revenue limit, which is currently $10,610 or $618. Um, that's the max per pupil revenue limit for Holman. Um, I also am not recommending a change in the per pupil categorical aid per member, which is $742 per member. Um, these things could both change uh, with the legislative session that's approaching. And at that time, um, we would use changes in the revenue limit per member or the per pupil categorical per member um, if, if it, the state says that there's gonna be a change made. So right now I'm leaving it as is to be um, hopefully conservative, um, projecting the revenue going forward per pupil. I'm gonna skip down to other revenue assumptions, investment income. Um, so for several years, we had pretty decent interest income. We were carrying balances from the safety and security referendum until those projects were completed. Um, and um, investment interest was, was pretty good until the pandemic hit. Um, so not so much anymore. The balances aren't as high and the interest rate is pretty poor. So looking at investment income potentially for FY22 at 0.25%, 
um, with a conservative increase and hope that the economy improves and the interest rates will improve uh, as it does um, in the future years of the five-year forecast. So down in the levy assumptions, the bottom of page two, we have the Fund 10 levy. This is the revenue side of the three years remaining on the technology referendum. So three years of $450,000 in technology referendum. And then um, in Fund 80 uh, levy, 100,000 for all five years. This could certainly change. Um, this is for the community uh, liaison position that we're supporting at the Boys and Girls Club, as well as um, program development for after school supports for students such as tutoring um, and materials. So that is a project that is in the works um, in developing those programs. We anticipate continuing to help support the BGC, our community, our parents and our students um, for those positions through the Community Fund 80. Let's see. Um, and then the very last one on this page is the special education aidable cost reimbursement. So the percentage that is put into the forecast here is actually the current year percentage. Um, we're receiving 28.21% on prior year eligible special education costs. So um, unfortunately, that, even though that is an increase over the last year, um, the state appropriation for special education is still not sufficient and therefore it's highly prorated. So our eligible costs are prorated down for reimbursement um, from 100% to 28.21%. Um, so I am not confident in putting a higher number in here and we'll have to keep an eye on whether or not there's actually a decrease in this um, this reimbursement um, based on that proration and the pot of money distributed at the state level. So the other document that was included um, with your issue paper and the uh, document we just looked at was the enrollment and membership. This information comes from our third Friday count September, so September 18th of 2020. This was an information presented at the annual meeting and budget hearing October 26th. Um, it includes the enrollment and membership, um, our headcount of 3,861, and then um, just the calculation on how we get to membership that's applied to revenue limit and state equalization aid. So just wanted you to also have a copy of that information um, by grade level, and then you can see there too the non-resident students and the resident students. So you subtract those that open enrolled um, out of the equation, you add in those that left the school district at home and so resident district students, and then you get your total residents of 4,113. And that is um, this year's 2021 count um, for membership calculation. So are there any questions um, on membership, I mean, on input variables. I know it's a long night. <laughs> no questions? All right, <laughs> All right. So now we go on to consent agenda items. And I think I, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I have to ask if anybody wants, any board members want to discuss any item and anything to be pulled. Is that correct? Does anybody want anything to be pulled? Okay. Um, so do we have a motion to approve the consent agenda items? Um, so move. So move. Anita has moved and anybody to second it? Gary? <laughs> Thank you. Oops. Um, so Anita has moved and Gary has seconded the motion to approve the consent agenda items as presented. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion to approve the consent agenda items, please signify by saying yes. 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 Those opposed signify by saying no. Motion passes. Okay, just let me scroll down here. Sorry, sorry. 
So now on to board member reports and discussions. First, I will call upon board members in the order of the roll call, and I would ask you to present any comments or committee reports you have, and we'll start with Trenton. Is he still here? Yeah. Um, uh, I don't have too much to say. I just want to um, thank all the people that came out tonight, as usual, um, to present us with new information, and, um, and it makes me happy hearing the, the recommendation for the COVID stuff. Hopefully things are looking up. Um, Mm -hmm. Hopefully we can start doing things again because I know there's a lot of people that um, really just waiting to get back into their activities and their sports because it really does um, does bring a lot of happiness to everyone. So really excited mm -hmm. to hear. That. Thanks, Trenton. Gary, do you have anything? I'm just glad that freaking elections over with. I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think we should maybe start teaching some classes on common sense, though. By, by my opinion. Thanks, Gary. How, Anita, what do you have? <laughs> it's hard to follow that up. I know. <laughs> um, I would agree with Gary. Um, I wanted to thank everybody who did all the work to get all those presentations for us tonight. And like Julie said, it's been a long night, but boy, I, I can't imagine all the hours and hours of work that went into all that. So thank you to everybody, everybody who presented. And I have to say, I took a note when the music um, department was presenting, and I really want to know more about the traveling ukulele unit because that sounded. <laughs> awesome. um, other than that, we have a personnel and governance committee meeting this Wednesday, and um, that is all I have because I'm thinking Chris may have given a little update at the last meeting um, when I was absent. So. Thanks, Anita. Chris, do you have anything? Uh, no, just a lot of great information tonight. So thank you for the time and effort into presenting that stuff. So it was, it's, it's, the, it's the meat and potatoes of the school board. So it's good to get that stuff out there for everybody to see. So uh, thanks for everybody that participated tonight and came out. Thanks, Chris. Barb, do you have anything? Just echoing that. Thanks to everyone. A lot of hard work. But, uh, Brian, I'm sorry, Brian. Self committee will be meeting next Monday, and I'd like to wish everyone a happy holidays. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then I, oops, sorry, did I miss anybody? Anita, did you have something else? No, I said I. Yeah, I forgot we aren't going to meet again before. I know. Uh, so I don't want to butt in, but happy holidays. Thanks for the reminder, Brian. Um, and then I know there was a building and grounds tour today. Um, I was not present, so I apologize for that again. Um, but I know it was a tour of the facility, so I hope it went well. And then um, I want to go back to eighth grade social studies is all I have to say. <laughs> that looked most interesting to me tonight. And then happy holidays and see you next. Oh, no, we'll see. Yeah, we'll see you next year. And then hopefully 2021 is a little bit better. Anybody have anything else? Okay. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Is there any other business that needs to come to the come before the board at this time? If not, I would entertain a motion to adjourn this meeting. I moved. Anita has moved. Anybody a second? Barb, second it. Second to adjourn the meeting at oh wow, nine twenty-seven p.m. We um, have to vote. We have to vote to adjourn. We have to vote for that one. Yeah. Okay. How in favor? All in favor. To adjourn the meeting at 928. Aye. Aye. Woo. Opposed. Uh, motion passes. That's all I know. Is that it? Nice job, Rebecca. <laughs> Thanks, you guys. Good luck, Cheryl. I hope she's sleeping already, though. <laughs> Good night, Good night you guys. Night.